Hello, I'm Leonard Middleton. Presentation will be about the importance of uh, the assets and the to the value they provide, provide and the effect that has in terms of effective asset management. So let's get started. So quick agenda here. First, doing introductions. I'll uh, give you a quick bit of my background and whatnot. Then we're going to talk a little bit about in terms of uh, improving the performance in asset intensive uh, industries and how selection of the assets uh, uh, make a big difference there. We'll also talk in terms of the importance of the fiscal assets to the organization and how the assets can help in terms of providing value to the organization. Then we're going to move on to recommendations. Recommendations looking at three different categories here, the selection and investment uh, in the assets. Also talk in terms of how well uh, the execution of any projects were done. And then finally, we're going to do a feedback in terms of understanding how smart the investment was, how well it was executed, those types of things. And then just a short uh, summary in terms of what we, uh, what it all leads to. So quick introduction here. As you can tell from the picture in the corner, I'm not a, a fresh-faced uh, new graduate. I've uh, been around for a long time, I've done a lot of different work in asset intensive uh, industries uh, internationally, uh, been consulting in the last while in maintenance reliability and asset management. I have degrees both in the engineering area and in business, so formal training there. Uh, through the experience and the training, I've got designations and professional designations in engineering, project management, maintenance reliability, and asset management. Uh, consulted globally in a number of asset intensive industries. What we're going to be talking about here is a number of different perspectives that involve engineering, uh, business, project management, and the aspect of maintenance reliability and asset management, and how we look as well as business and how this all fits together in terms of how we look at things. So the initial step in improving performance, if we go back to the ISO 55,000 standard uh, which the 55,000 um, is the overview principles and definitions. We acquire assets for the value they provide to the organization. So we're selecting assets to make sure that they provide us with the best value that they can. We wanna make sure that we make a very good investment here. Asset management basically is how do we get value from those assets? Let's do coordinating activities within across the organization, a holistic approach to realize the vast value from those assets. My perspective on this is that fundamentally that the assets are the physical embodiment of the organization's actual asset management strategy. State whatever you would like in terms of what you aspire to be, what your, your mission, vision, and whatever else is, but if I look at your physical assets, that tells me more in terms of what it actually is, the way you invest your money than does any sort of statement. In fact, the problem is that should there be a contradiction between the documented strategy and what the assets say, then that's gonna result in some confusion and some cynicism. Assets have a very significant impact on revenue and operation and maintenance costs for the life of the asset, and once we get the concepts and embody them into concrete and steel, it would be extremely difficult to change them in any significant way that could improve the uh, situation. So to get the highest value, we need to make sure that the assets are suitable for their intended use. This is fundamental. So how are we going to use the asset? What is the context we're going to use it in? And let's make sure we get the best assets we can. So as well as the functional requirements, we're also going to need to understand what the operating rates are, what sort of quality standards we have for the assets in terms of either production or our service offering. Um, what sort of mandatory standards, safety standards, environmental standards, construction standards, all things like that. We need to know that. Now, if we're going to make sure that we get the production that we want from the assets, then there has to be allowance in the operating schedule or in the operating rate for the maintenance and overhaul activities. Otherwise, you're not going to get what you want out of it. And similarly, you have to have specified what the reliability should be and what the maintainability should be. 
how often can we tolerate the equipment failing and how long can we tolerate the equipment being down on average? Those things do are important and they're often overlooked. Continuing on, it is difficult to fix the deficiencies of substandard physical assets. So it is important to get it right in the beginning. Much more effective use of the resources than trying to fix things after the fact. In fact, one of the problems we run into is that it may not be technically feasible to make a change to the asset. It may be that the asset can't be changed and you'd have to pull it out and put another one in. Or it may be such that you can't put together a suitable business case that would justify making changes to the asset. And then finally, organizations and people do not like saying, we've made a mistake. And so if you're in a situation where you're trying to have to put another capital in place, another project in place to fix what was done already recently, then you may find that it's not politically feasible because nobody's going to want to sign off and say, oh, we made a mistake here. So let's take a look now in terms of the importance of physical assets to the organization itself. So we may make changes to the assets, either the assets themselves or the asset mix we have. Changes may be a result of a mandatory requirement. There's been some change in, in regulations or that, or there may be changes in the business context that we need to address. Could be changes in the organization itself in terms of what their strategic objectives are. So maybe now we're going to uh, go further into one sort of business sector and maybe leave another, or it may be any number of things in terms of strategic objectives. We could be doing it to improve business performance. We could be improving the quality, either the products, product offering or the service offering, and that may be able to get us either uh, a higher margin for our offering, or maybe it will allow us to sell it into a market uh, more so than our competitors can, and, and therefore increase the volume that way. We could be focusing on economies of scale and looking at increasing the volume. Uh, that's particularly important in a commodity uh, environment where we can sell everything we make. We could be doing it for flexibility in the volume in terms of product mix or features. In fact, with today's the technologies there, 3D printing, 2D uh, cutting of either laser, uh, water jet, abrasive, uh, we can basically start building customization in batch lots of one. Or we could be doing it to address the operating costs, uh, maybe automation and reducing the amount of labor involved. We could be doing it to uh, reduce the variable costs, maybe we can find a lower cost input to use, or maybe just to reduce some of the overheads involved in, in the uh, operation. Now, let's talk a little bit in terms of how we measure performance. In asset intensive industries, frequently measure the capital effectiveness by return on investment, return on net investment. So we have this investment over the years of these assets. And in fact, we, uh, that becomes part of the balance sheet where we have these uh, assets there and that tells us how much we've invested over the years in that. And then based upon that, how much money does that generate? So if we've done a really good job of investing in our assets, then that should generate us a higher benefit, a higher return. So we look at our earnings relative to our assets. So very simply, if we wanna increase the overall return on assets, then any new initiative needs to have a higher return on asset than the organizational average. Simple math, if you wanna improve their average, then whatever you do going forward, you have to make sure that your new initiatives are higher than the, uh, the average is. Now, we're going to look here now at a simple graph of a cumulative project uh, cash flow versus time. And so we have a, a uh, green line here showing a project baseline. And so for the first part of it is the project phase down to the bottom of the trough there on the green line. And so that's just standard S curve that we are so familiar with in terms of project management where it starts off slowly, it builds 
And then it starts, the effort sort of drops off as we get near the end of the project and we're getting near the end of the schedule. Hopefully we're uh, getting near the end of the budget as well and we haven't overshot the budget. And then finally we go and we start putting into service at the bottom of the trough there. We start generating some revenue and we have operating costs and maintenance costs to offset that. And so we start earning some money and continue it up until eventually we reach the point where we pay back the project at the zero line there, where what we invested in the project now gets paid that back by uh, revenue, by the uh, revenue minus our uh, operating and maintenance costs and continues on to the uh, life of the asset. Now, the key thing here to understand is the slope of that line depends on how quickly we can generate the cash, the earnings, if you would, relative to time. So the higher the return over time, the steeper the curve is. So the slope of the curve would be much higher, where if we're not doing as well, the slope of the curve is going to be flatter. And therefore we're not generating as much earnings over time as, uh, as we would otherwise. So this is a project baseline. Now the next uh, graph, I'm gonna show you uh, another graph. This one here based on the project baseline, and we have showing a project here based on that baseline that didn't do so well. So there's a number of things we wanna show here. So you, again, we can see the, the red curve there where it follows the same S curve. It has a trough at the bottom, it starts going into service and then starts to return uh, money on its investment. However, as you can see where the bottom of the trough of the green baseline, project baseline is versus the bottom of the trough on the failed project is that we have a cost overrun. And then it also, if you take a look at where on the uh, timeline there, where the trough on the baseline is versus the trough on the failed project red line is, that we have a uh, schedule delay there as well. So if we combine the two of them, we take a look there that there is a delay we finally generate the same amount of cash there from, from the bottom of the uh, trough of the project baseline to part way up on the, uh, that's a delay there on the uh, failed project uh, line there. And the delays caused by the project cost overrun and the project schedule delay. So we can see that. So if we transfer that, that delay up to the zero uh, line there, we see that that doesn't quite cover the entire gap. There's a small gap there that I show in red. And that's the delay caused by the, the poor return on investments of the project deliverables. What may not be easily seen here is that the slope of the red line is much flatter than the slope of the green line. And that will exist for as long as the asset runs in that situation in that context. So this is a long-term issue where the project cost overrun and the uh, delay are short-term issues. And as I said, so this is gonna have a big impact in terms of the life cycle cost for as long as the asset is operated that way. So importance of physical assets to the organization. Well, for me, the assets are sort of walking the talk. So say what you will, but let's see what you do. So, and I've seen this times where there's a mission or an objective or a goal that they're going to aspire to be a world-class operation, but the name of every supplier, every service provider is called low bid. It's not going to happen. The investment focus should be on value, that is benefit relative cost, not just on cost alone. The problem with a cost focus that you can compromise the benefits from the project deliverables. In one particular case, I was at a petrochemical plant that never operated above 75% of the nameplate rating. And that was because decisions made early on that compromised the, uh, the plant itself. And so it was a very poor operation and extremely poor investment on the part of the company. So now we're gonna get into recommendations and as I said, the, the three class of recommendations, selecting and investing in the assets, and then in terms of project execution, and then 
doing a uh, follow-up and finding out how smart you were in terms of the investment and the execution itself. So, <clears throat> first of all, suggest you use a structured evaluation uh, process. You want to make the evaluation as objective as possible so it's not a situation where whoever pounds the table the loudest or whoever uh, talks the loudest or yells the loudest or has the higher ranking that know that these are all evaluated properly. The scoring should include any strategic objectives, any mandatory requirements in terms of environmental safety, anything like that, any risk issues, because you know we can maybe get a higher return if we take on more risk, but then there's a potential that things may not work out and we've got a problem there. We want to deal with any sort of required timing or urgent issues, or as well dependencies where I need to do uh, three different projects. I need all three of these things to be done in sequence. Otherwise, I'm not going to get the benefit. And we want to do that as well as financial analysis, be it whatever your organization uses, uh, net present value, internal rate of return, or payback period, or uh, any of the number issues. If it's appropriate the situation, I would focus more on terms of increased revenue rather than cost reduction. You can always maybe pick up some of the stuff in terms of cost reduction, but if you don't have the money to pay for it uh, through revenue, then you, you've got a problem there. Okay, we want to identify all the dependencies. We may have a situation where the benefits may not be fully achieved without implementing all the dependencies. Case in point, so new uh, software system, CMS, whatever, and without the process changes or effective end, uh, uh, end user training, you are not gonna get the benefit there. In fact, if the benefit is transactional efficiencies only, so maybe I need fewer people to do the job, then there's insufficient benefit there to justify the large investment. And then you are doing what my friends in the IT world refer to as paving the cow path. So no benefit, it's just, it makes somebody uh, feel a little bit better and makes things a little bit easier, but it doesn't have the return that it should have. Identify all the resources. We want to make sure that all the resources we need to be successful on this are identified and evaluated as part of the process. So include changes to the operating expenditure. It may be a situation where you're going to be able to reduce the cost going forward. So that's part of the benefit. Uh, any sort of required uh, capital expenditure to achieve the benefit. And also identify the value of in-house resources required as well. Um, have had a situation where uh, some clients are unable to do all the work that they would otherwise like to do because uh, they don't have enough of the in-house uh, resources. The other thing too is the in-house resources should be able to provide value in some other areas. So you have to watch that you do not skew the uh, financial analysis by using in-house resources versus outside resources. They should be, the, should be able to go and figure out, monetize what the value of those in-house resources would be versus what cost to do it uh, outside so that they're all evaluated properly. Continuing, this one's a bit different. I suggest you do an incremental analysis of the initiatives. So what is the impact of a small increase? And so what is the impact on the benefit? So if I spend 1% more, will it give me 2% greater uh, benefit? And uh, that makes sense. May go ahead uh, with that. It may be an issue where we maybe increase the quality and therefore we can uh, improve our market share by uh, being the preferred supplier. Or it may be that we can get a higher value for our product. It may be a matter of maybe we can increase, increase the volume or increase the reliability. Things that would add additional value to the organization. Now, this is counter to the common practice where we don't meet the approval threshold, so we try to find ways of taking project costs out. So we maybe reduce some of the functionality, maybe reduce some of the spare parts, maybe reduce some of the training, whatnot. And the situation is, so then we go and recalculate based upon the original benefit. Well, the problem is that's a bit of a lie because you're not going to have the original benefit after you remove those costs because you wouldn't have achieved all the benefit. So if you don't understand how the benefits are achieved, 
you can reduce the benefit and the return on investment. Or the other aspect is you may increase the project risk and not realize it. So do be aware of that. Take a look at the incremental analysis, but from a, if I increase it, what's the value? What additional value might that bring to me? And is it worth doing that? And therefore I'll increase the return on asset and it would make more sense doing this rather than it would be trying to find a lower cost way of doing it, but providing much less benefit. Involve end users in the development and evaluation of initiatives. So these are people who have particular knowledge and different perspectives regarding the way the assets are operated and maintained. So you want to gain their insight in terms of the assets, the issues that need to be addressed. If they're dealing with this stuff on a regular basis, they know where the problems lie and can help ensure that we don't make the same problems again. It's surprising how many times we repeat the problems that happened before in the new projects. It seems like sometimes organizations don't learn. Um, and then we can use it for the development of solutions. So we get better solutions with their knowledge and perspectives and their buy-in. If you're involved in identifying the problem and developing solutions into it, then you're gonna be more apt to buy into the situation and therefore support it, as opposed to standing on the sidelines and uh, throwing stones. Uh, it may require additional effort by technical resources to communicate with the non-technical resources. Uh, these are people who may not, uh, may not know the engineering calculations or even know how to read uh, drawings in terms of single lines or layout drawings. So it may require some additional effort by the technical resources but well worth the effort, one, because of the better decisions that get made and also the improved buy-in and the easier way. And it could be that they may be able to find some solutions that nobody else could have done. Now let's take a look at project execution. So we need the resources needed to effectively execute. We wanna make sure the resources, yes, are competent, but we want to make sure they've got the time available and the time is allocated to perform the assigned tasks. And similarly, we want a competent project manager and we want to make sure that there's time allocated for the role of the project manager. So the situation often is that the resources and the project manager may be assigned to multiple projects, but do make sure that the level of effort isn't expected to be a 12 to 16 hour day each and every day, given the number of projects that uh, are assigned to them. So do be careful of that. So we want good resources. We also want resources with enough time to do what they need to do to properly do the job. And much like the one we talked before, involve the end users in the project execution team. Better decisions with the different perspectives and increased knowledge and combined with the project's team specialists. Improves communication and buying with those who have much influence and much to say about the project success and they can act as a conduit to other end users. And so they can communicate what's happening and what improvements are going to be made and send out the information from the project and bring information in from other end users into the project. And again, as noted before, may require additional uh, effort by the technical resources uh, just to handle the communication. The other aspect is oftentimes organizations say, well, yeah, we let the end users, we give them the drawings, they've got a week to review them and get back to us. Uh, oh, by the way, don't change anything because if you change anything, we won't let you do that because it'll impact the budget and or the schedule. So it's just for your information only, don't do anything with that. Be smart in the projects. Well, plan well and watch for and manage the deviations. In project management, there's a couple of fundamental skills. Uh, one is being able to put together a good project plan based upon what the deliverables are, what activities you need to do to that, the relationship between activities, what dependencies there are, uh, what level of effort is required in duration, loading, managing resource and that. So putting together a good project plan is important. The other thing is being able to manage once the project gets going and you have to deviate from the plan. There's all sorts of things that happen up there. So basically front end loading, that front end work is required for good project management. One of the truisms, truisms we have in project management, we do not plan to fail, but unfortunately we may fail to plan properly. 
So keep that in mind. Now, if we remember there at the bottom of that trough there, there was that small ramp up time. And that is very, very important from a point of view of generating cash flow as soon as possible. Also find out if there's any deficiency that need to be addressed and need to be addressed quickly. And it also has a major psychological impact that if things do not go well at the beginning, then if there's any problems later on, that that part is brought up. So keep that in mind. So plan the, plan the ramp up phase. You wanna make sure you plan that well. Make sure you've identified all the resources and the resources are prepared and available for use. So we've got all sorts of documents. We've got the current drawings, including any as built We may have operation and maintenance manuals. We may have standard operating procedures that all should be developed and ready to go, particularly those that aren't used frequently. So the emergency startup, the emergency shutdown type of things should be documented before the, uh, the startup. We wanna make sure we've identified what maintenance tactics we're going to use to maintain it. Uh, you could possibly use a real ambulatory center maintenance and RCM approach to that. Uh, all else fails, you could go with the, uh, the OEM recommendations. Not a big one on that one, but anyways. Uh, put together job plans in terms of how to execute that. Have together the bill of materials, the spare parts list necessary. You want to make sure that at the time that we're doing the startup, you've got the supporting spares and any special tools required to uh, operate and maintain it. You want to make sure the resource to operate and maintain it have been properly trained and they're competent resources, the best people you've got. And this will get it online and ramped up sooner. It will start generating cash sooner. And that will be a viewed as a very successful project at that point in time, or for that point anyways. So now we've uh, selected and invested in projects, we've done and executed it. Now, how good was that all overall? So evaluate the performance of the project deliverables. You're not gonna be able to evaluate them right after the project is done, but you can do that after the deliverables have been in service. You wanna make sure it's sufficient time to properly evaluate if it met the initial prom promises and whether the benefit was such that it, we got the return on assets that we wanted. Okay. So we're getting this benefit and this is a cash value. It is for us and here's what it costs us and does that match what it is we, that was promised. Include all actual one-time uh, project related costs, both the capital expenditure and the operating expenditure. <laughs> the reason I emphasize that is Remember we said there that the project gets into service. Well, there may be a situation that there may still be deficiencies, but the project team says, no, we've run out of time. We've run out of money. Take it, there it is, operate it with it. So there sometimes if the deficiencies are so difficult to overcome, you may find that operating expenditure is used to address the project deliverable deficiencies. And so, that should still be included in the evaluation, even though it becomes out of the operating expense rather than the capital expense, because somebody's cheating here a little bit. And you see the perform, performance of the project deliverables, we wanna make sure that, that is a key measure of the project success. So what revenue it generates, the operating and maintenance costs, any sort of uh, quality of the uh, product or service offering, uh, output volumes, all those sorts of things, we want all that to measure the success of the project. Because the situation is that with the long-term impact of the deliverables, the project deliverables, it has a bigger impact, a much bigger impact than does the budget and schedule compliance of the organization. In fact, if we do a really good job in terms of the project deliverables, even if we do have a non-compliance either budget or schedule, it may be the project deliverables could overcome that and offset, offset it. So unfortunately, oftentimes we just evaluate project delivery in terms of budget compliance and schedule compliance, and we never really look properly in terms of how good the deliverables themselves were. And you have a structure evaluation process. Well, particularly at the beginning, we wanna go back and take a look and find out if indeed is working as it should. So the priority should be correct, correctly affected in the scoring, including any dependencies. We wanna make sure that the right projects were approved and lower priority projects were not approved over higher priority ones. We wanna make sure that the system works as it should. 
and adjust any scoring or weighting as required to improve the, the uh, evaluation results. So it's a feedback to make sure that we're doing well there. So this basically about it. And so I just want to sort of finish off here with a short summary. We want to make sure the organizational culture is embedded with a philosophy in addressing the assets in the beginning. If we start off with good assets, then it makes it a whole lot easier in terms of providing the performance and value for the organization. This, as the investment decisions are typically made at the top of the organization, it's especially critical there. Well, I hope you found this informative. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, be happy to take them. Here's my email address. A uh, great believer in continuous improvement, including my own work. So uh, please uh, let me know what you think. Uh, I will be available for a uh, Q&A session at uh, now. So let's hear it. Thank you. Thank you.